Our topic tonight is Countdown to Eternity, the Left Behind series, the Bible Codes, the Da Vinci Code, the Lost Tomb of Jesus, the Gospel of Judas. How many of you have heard of some of these things? You know, Christian themes, it seems, in recent years, we can find all throughout even secular media. The world is focusing on Christian things. Why is that? I think one of the reasons may be because we're seeing some things happening in the world today that really haven't happened like this in the past. We see all kinds of wars going on all around the world. How many of you have noticed that, right? This is going on. How about devastation, cat catastrophes? How about things like uh, floods and hurricanes, Katrina, New Orleans, right? These are terrible things that have been going on. What about some, uh, some financial crises? Have we seen any of those recently? People are losing their homes, they're losing their jobs. People are beginning to wonder, is there something bigger going on in life than we realized before? Are the sands in the proverbial hourglass of time beginning to run out? A lot of people are beginning to wonder if that's the case, and I think perhaps it may indeed be. Many different magazines, and especially tabloids, are beginning to pick up on this. For example, here's one, this is The Sun. It says, end times have begun, prophecy secrets from the Vatican vaults. Now, I don't know that we should necessarily learn about Bible prophecy from the tabloids in the supermarkets. What do you think? <laughs> Probably not the best place to go. But even mainstream magazines like Newsweek magazine are beginning to pick up on these. This is one from 1999, Prophecy, it says, what the Bible says about the end of the world. Now, of course, that was just before the year 2000, and many people were worried that the year 2000, January 1, was going to bring about what? Terrible catastrophes, maybe even the end of the world, right? Well, we all survived that. That wasn't the case. But are we seeing some things in the world today that we really haven't seen before, yes or no? We really are. We see that time is running out, and we need to know exactly where we stand in the timeline of Earth's history. Many people are trying to figure out what the future holds, and some of them are going to the occult. They're going to the prophecies of Nostradamus. Maybe that's a good place to go, some people think. We all want to know what the future holds. What lies beyond today? Well, let me ask you this question. What great event is much of the Christian world expecting in the very near future? What event do you think that might be? What about the return of Jesus Christ? Are a lot of people looking forward to that in the near future, yes or no? Absolutely they are. Well, why is that? Why are so many people looking forward to that and expecting it to occur very, very soon? Let's open our Bibles tonight and find an answer. Turn to the last book in your Bible, that is the book of Revelation, and we're going to go to the last chapter in the last book of your Bible, that is Revelation chapter 22. And for those of you who are taking notes tonight, the first scriptures that we're going to look at are Revelation chapter 22, verses 7, 12, and 20. Revelation chapter 22, verses 7, 12, and 20. We're in Revelation chapter 22, beginning with verse number what? Seven. Revelation 22, verse number 7. It says, Behold, I come how? Quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let's go down now to verse number 12. Verse 12 says, And behold, I come how? Quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now let's drop down to verse number 20. Verse 20 says, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come how? Quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. So as we read those verses, something is pretty evident from them, isn't it? The Bible says that Jesus is coming how? He is coming quickly. He is coming very, very soon. Well, a lot of people are wondering about exactly how soon that's going to be, and can we understand it? Can we interpret it correctly? Uh, let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to look at another picture of Jesus coming very soon. Revelation chapter 14 this time we're going to go to the heart of Revelation, Revelation 14 and verse number 14. Here we have a prophetic picture, a symbolic picture of Jesus returning. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. John says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So another picture here through Revelation of Jesus returning. Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 1, we're seeing here a theme that runs through the book of Revelation, a very significant theme. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 7. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, 
and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So all through the book of Revelation, we find that Jesus is coming again, and it says he's coming very, very quickly. Now, even though the Bible speaks so much about Jesus returning, do you think that it's possible that some people might not be ready for Jesus when he comes back? Do you think that's possible? Sure, absolutely. Do you think that it might even be possible for some people who are, or maybe we'll say who claim to be Christians, do you think that maybe even some of them might not be ready? I think we can just about bank on that. Because consider this. Remember when Jesus came the first time 2,000 years ago? They, were people ready for Jesus when he came the first time, yes or no? No. Were they expecting the Messiah? Yes, they were. But when he came, not only did most of them not recognize him and accept him as the Messiah, what did they end up doing to him? They ended up killing him. They ended up crucifying him. Boy, talk about a big mistake, right? There were two reasons, two primary reasons, why people were not ready for Jesus the first time he came. And I would submit to you that these same two reasons are probably going to be significant reasons why people will not be ready for Jesus when he comes back the next time. Here are those two reasons. Number one, people were not studying the scriptures for themselves. You know, they would go to church and they would listen to what the, the rabbi would say or the teacher would say, but they weren't studying them for themselves. How about today? Are there people who will go to church every week? They'll put their $20 bill, their $50 bill in the offering plate. They'll pray the prayers. They'll sing the songs, but they don't study the scriptures for themselves. Are there people like that? Yes or no? Yes, there are. Second group of people or second reason, people were following religious leaders instead of the scriptures. Well, what about today? Do we find any examples of people who may go to church, but instead of following the Bible or Jesus Christ, they're following a man instead? Does that happen? There's two very graphic examples. You have Marshall Applewhite, who is the leader of the Heaven's Gate cult. Some of you may remember that just a few years ago. I think it was 30-some people, 20-some people, 30-some people who took their lives after following him. Remember the hale -Bopp comet was coming? They thought there was some sort of a UFO after it. They were studying the Bible, but were they following it? No, they weren't. How about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians down in Waco, Texas? Were they studying the Bible? Yes, they were. You know one of the books that they spent a lot of time studying? Book of Revelation. But were they following the Bible or were they following a man? They were following a man. You know, Jesus gives us very stern warning about following men. In Matthew chapter 24, it says here in Matthew 24 verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. I believe the greatest fear any preacher ought to have is that somebody will leave his church and say, you know, Pastor so-and-so said, or Reverend so-and-so said. You know, I hope nobody ever leaves this auditorium and says, well, Eric said. You know, because what Eric has to say doesn't amount to a hill of beans. The only thing that matters is what does God say. Amen? That's why we're going to open our Bible each and every evening many, many times, and we're going to look a lot at Scripture because we want to find out what God says. Now, when we take a look at the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, can it be a little bit confusing, yes or no? Yes, it can. There are a lot of people who are confused. God gives us, though, the book of Revelation for several reasons, one of which is to dissipate a lot of the delusions that are going to be happening at end time. But when people look at it, they see all these different beasts. You have the, uh, the beasts of Revelation chapter 13, the one that comes up out of the sea, the one that comes up out of the land. You also have this uh, woman who rides on a dragon. You have these three angels flying through the skies, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And some people say, man, there's just no way that we can understand this. How are we supposed to understand these things? In fact, some people say we shouldn't even study the book of Revelation, that it's a closed book. How many of you have ever heard that before? Closed book. Don't even bother studying it. Too confusing. Well, let's find out tonight, especially if we're going to be studying this, whether we should be studying it or not. Back to Revelation chapter 1, where probably you are. Revelation chapter 1, verse number 1. Let's see if it's a closed book or an open book. Revelation 1, 1 says, the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop right there for a second and dwell on this. It's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the root word of revelation? Reveal. What does reveal mean? It means to show or to open, right? What would the opposite of reveal be? To close or to hide. So if I were to stand up here tonight and tell you that tonight I'm going to reveal to you how old my wife is, what would you expect me to do? Maybe tell you somebody once shouted out, lie. Well, I'm not going to do that. But you would expect me maybe to tell you how many years she has lived, when she was born, something like that. 
I'm no fool. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to reveal it to you. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to what? Conceal it. But this is not the concealing of Jesus Christ. It is the revealing or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now look at verse number 3 there. Verse 3 says, Blessed is he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and do what else? And keep them. So if we read it, if we study it, if we hear the words, and we keep the things that we find here, the Bible says we're going to receive a, a blessing. How many of you could use a blessing from the Lord? then that's what we're going to be doing each evening. We're going to open the pages of Scripture, study it, learn about it, apply it to our lives, and we will receive a blessing. In fact, if you'd like a cross-reference for receiving a blessing from studying the book of Revelation, write down Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 7. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 7 tells us that we receive a blessing from studying the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation has 404 verses in it. Of those 404 verses, 276 are found in other books of the Bible. So if we want to really understand the book of Revelation, what are we also necessarily going to have to study? The other books of the Bible. Now there is one book specifically in the Old Testament that is kind of a twin of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is kind of the big prophetic book in the New Testament. What's the big prophetic book in the Old Testament? It is the book of Daniel. So we'll spend a lot of time going back and forth between Daniel and Revelation in this seminar. Because nine times out of ten, if you can't understand something that's in the book of Revelation, you go to the book of Daniel and it explains it. And if you go to the book of Daniel and you're reading through and studying and you can't understand something, nine times out of ten, if you go over to the book of Revelation, it explains it. So we'll be going back and forth between Daniel and Revelation quite a bit in this seminar. In fact, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Daniel right now. And as you turn there, I'm going to put a scripture up here on the screen from the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verse number 9, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. So God says that he lets us know beforehand what's going to come to pass. And we're going to look in the book of Daniel tonight and find an example of exactly that. Turn to the book of Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, we are going to look at an ancient king's dream, a very significant dream. I want to invite you to journey back in time with me tonight in your mind's eye. We're going to go back 2,500 years to the year 605 B.C. We're going to go to the ancient kingdom of Babylon, to the capital city of that kingdom, which was the city of Babylon. It was a very significant city. It was kind of the, the crux of where everything happened in the, in the ancient empires of the world. All the wealth, all the knowledge of the empire came through the kingdom in the city of Babylon. So we're going to go back to the year 605 B.C. We're going to imagine that we're walking up the processional way to the Ishtar Gate and right into the heart of antiquity. The ruler of Babylon in 605 B.C. was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He was very wise, very intelligent, very powerful, very wealthy, and again, he, he ruled one of the most significant empires in the history of the world. One night, he fell asleep, and he had a very significant dream. He was wondering what the future of Babylon would be, and as he was dreaming, he had this very vivid dream. In fact, it was so vivid that he woke right up. How many of you have ever had that happen? Have this very powerful dream, and you woke right up out of the dream. But when he woke up, he forgot what he'd been dreaming about. Has that ever happened to you? You sit bolt upright in bed and you go, what did I just dream about? I woke up, now I'm awake and I don't know what I was thinking about. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. So we're going to pick this story up in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. In other words, he woke up. Verse 2 says, Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now these were the individuals who were given the task of interpreting the king's dreams. 
Verse 3 says that the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. That's not very hard, is it? If somebody told you a dream, do you think you could come up with a pleasing interpretation? That's not tough at all. That's what they'd been doing for quite some time. But there was a problem this time. What was the problem? Couldn't remember the dream. In verse 5, it says, The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. In other words, I can't remember it. If ye will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Nebuchadnezzar says, Listen, boys, I've been paying you well, and I expect you to deliver right now. And if you cannot tell me what my dream was, and tell me what the interpretation is, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut off your arms. I'm going to cut off your legs. I'm going to cut off your head. I'm going to chop you up into little bitty pieces, and I'm going to turn your house into a sewage treatment plant. We would today call Nebuchadnezzar a motivational speaker, <laughs> wouldn't we? How many of you would be motivated? I mean, these guys were, for sure. But they were not able to deliver. Now this was not, I should point out, this was not a rash command from the king because he realized if they couldn't tell him something that happened 24 hours in the past, how were they going to be able to tell him something that would happen 24 hours in the future or 24 years or 2400 years in the future? They had betrayed his trust and so he sent out a decree that all the wise men in Babylon should be executed. Now that decree that went out went to all the wise men, including some people whose names we know. Let's drop down to uh, verse number 16. There were several men whose names we know, again, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were wise men serving there in the palace of the king. But these men did not serve the gods that the other Chaldeans served. They served the God of heaven. Now, if you want to find out how they got there, you can read Daniel chapter 1, and you'll find that Nebuchadnezzar's army came to Jerusalem, and they took captive some of the promising young men there, brought them back to Babylon, retrained them to serve as wise men for the king. So this decree went out to all the wise men, regardless of who they were. And so the guards come knocking at Daniel and his friend's door one day, and they answer it and say, yes, may we help you? And the guards say, well, we're here to kill you. Can you imagine Daniel and his friend's response? So hang on a second. Take a look at verse 16. It says, Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him what? time and that he would show the king the interpretation. He says, let me go talk to the king and see if we can work something out here. So he goes and he asks for time. What do you think Daniel wanted time to do? What would you want to do? Pray, right? Daniel knew that the only hope he had was in prayer. He was facing a situation that was humanly unsolvable. He knew there was no way he was going to be able to come up with the king's dream and the interpretation and get himself out of it. So he took his predicament to God. Now, Daniel did not just go to God in times of distress. Daniel habitually went to God in prayer, didn't he? In fact, you read later in his life how it kind of got him in trouble. In fact, it got him thrown in the lion's den. But when times were good, Daniel went to God in prayer, and when times were bad, God, Daniel went to God in prayer. That God who answered Daniel's prayer 2,500 years ago is still very much alive today, isn't he? You know, regardless of what challenges you may be going through in your life right now, I want to tell you God is there. God cares about you. He knows what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're going through right now. You may be going through a divorce. You may have just gone through one. You may be going through some financial difficulties. You may be afraid that you're going to lose your home. You may be a student and you're wondering what the future holds for you. You may, you may be worried about your kids. Does it seem like the youth of today are heading in the right direction, generally speaking, or the wrong? Seems in a, in a lot of cases they may be heading in the wrong direction. That may be your child. You may find that your child is one that's heading the, the wrong direction, a different direction than where you want it to go. Friends, take your problems to God, and you will find that God will answer that prayer of yours. Amen? Trust God, he cares for you, and he wants the best for you and your children as well. So Daniel took his prayers to God. And God, did God answer his prayers, yes or no? He did. Let's take a look. Turn over to verse number 26. 
Daniel prays to God, and then he goes back in before the king the next day. Verse 26 says, The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that was his Babylonian name, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, I like the way he says this. He says, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? Daniel says, Can't these guys give you the answer? Well, it's the answer. Could they? Yes or no? No, they couldn't. Can they do any better today? No, they can't. But look who Daniel gives the credit to. Verse number 28. Daniel says, but there is a what? A God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Daniel says there is a God in heaven. How many of you believe that? What if you're going through struggles? What if you're going through challenges? What if your life is not what you'd hoped it would be? Is God still on the throne, yes or no? He is. I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. Write down 1 Peter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter 5, verse 7 tells us that God cares for you. He is not some distant God who sits off in a far corner of the universe, disinterested in what's going on in your life. He cares for you. You can also write down Amos 3, verse number 7. Amos 3, verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he revealeth his secrets unto his servants the prophets. So God lets his prophets know what's going to happen in the future so that the prophets can share it with the rest of us. How many of you are glad we've got the Bible? Amen? Amen. Glad that God speaks to his prophets so that we can know what's going to happen. Now let's drop down to uh, verse number 29. Daniel continues, and in verse 29 he says, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So he says, Nebuchadnezzar, God is showing you the future. Now, if you wish, you can follow along in your Bibles in verses 31 through 33, or if you'd like, you can follow up along the screen here. Daniel walks Nebuchadnezzar down through his dream and explains to him what the dream was all about. Here's how Daniel explains that dream to Nebuchadnezzar. He says in verse number 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. Here we go. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its feet, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Pretty impressive dream. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar's face must have looked like as Daniel recounted that dream to him? You can probably picture his eyes as big as saucers, his jaw dropping on the floor. Daniel was very confident as he gave this dream. In Daniel 2, verse number 36, Daniel says, this is the dream. Powerful. How did he know that was the dream? Who did he get it from? He got it from God. So he said, this is the dream. If it, if it had been me, I'd have probably walked up to Nebuchadnezzar and said, did I get it right? Was that it? Not Daniel. Daniel said, this is the dream. He was confident, amen? Now, if you were in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes and Daniel had just shared with you what you had dreamed about, what would the next question out of your mouth be? What does it mean, right? See, Nebuchadnezzar knew he could trust Daniel because Daniel had gotten it from God and he was accurate. So Nebuchadnezzar went to Daniel and says, what does it mean? Now, when you begin to talk about interpreting the prophecies of the Bible, a lot of people say, well, that's kind of just guesswork. I mean, you say it means one thing, somebody else says it means something else. I saw a guy on TV, saw a guy who wrote, wrote a book, and everybody says it's something different. It's just kind of guesswork, and you make it mean what you want it to mean. No. Who do we go to for the interpretation? We go to God through which prophet? Who was it? It was Daniel, right? So we're going to let Daniel interpret this prophecy for us. He says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 38, 
to Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. You, Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom of Babylon, you are that head of gold. So we don't have to guess and speculate what that's all about. He says, you're the head of gold. Babylon ruled from 605 down to 539 BC. Now that's kind of an interesting time period. 605 down to 539 BC. Can anybody do some quick math and tell me how many years that is? 66 years. Babylon is mentioned six times in the book of Revelation. Mentioned six times, ruled for 66 years. What number does that just vaguely remind you of? Kind of reminds you of the number 666 a little bit? But Babylon was fitly described as this head of gold because there were over 200 gold-domed temples within the city walls of Babylon. They also, gold was, gold was really the only uh, metal of any value there. Not much lower than that. Gold was, was kind of what the, the choice metal was. In fact, the city itself was very, uh, very significant, very uh, powerful, well-built. They had walls that stretched all the way around the city. The river Euphrates flowed right up through the center of the city. In fact, the river Euphrates that flowed through the middle of the city provided them with virtually an inexhaustible supply of water. It also kind of acted as a natural air conditioner. As it flowed through the city, it would cool the air there. Also within the city walls of, uh, of Babylon were the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world. How many of you have heard of them, them before, right? Nebuchadnezzar actually built them for his wife, who was a country girl, and he wanted her to feel at home in the city. So he built her the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Not a bad gift, huh, ladies? So I wish my husband would do that, right? But uh, they had over a 20-year food supply stored up within the walls of the city as a result of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Just a powerful, powerful city, uh, most definitely fitly described as this head of gold. So again, here's just a little idea of what the city looked like. This, of course, is an artist's representation, but it gives us an idea of what it was like. Be uh, Nebuchadnezzar was very proud of his city, and he was hoping that it would last forever. In fact, several years ago, archaeologists unearthed a tablet that had his uh, inscriptions on it, talking about his hopes and his desires for the city. He says in this inscription, may it last forever. Did it last forever, though? No, only 66 years. It ruled from 605 down to 539 BC. And then after that, another kingdom came along. Let's see which kingdom came along after the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel says here, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number, let's see here, 39. He says, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Daniel actually lived to see this happen. You can read the story a couple of uh, chapters later in Daniel chapter 5 of how Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, was ruling at the time, and he decided to have a great feast in the banquet hall of Babylon at a time when the army of the Medes and the Persians had surrounded the city. They were laying siege to it. Now, historians tell us that the Babylonians were not really too worried about this siege. Now, usually a siege means that nothing gets in and nothing gets out, especially food and water. And what, does that end up, what ends up happening to the people who are inside the city during a siege? They end up starving to death. Terrible things happen when a city is cut off and can't get food in. But uh, Babylon wasn't particularly concerned because they had this inexhaustible supply of water. They had the 20-year food supply from the gardens of Babylon. And so Belshazzar decided he was just going to have this great big party. And so he calls a thousand of his lords and ladies together, and they begin to feast. And during the festivities, he decides to drink a toast to his own gods. And so he calls for the vessels that had been, the cups and the bowls that had been brought by his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, from the temple in Jerusalem. He calls for them to be brought out and has wine poured in them and begins to toast his own gods. And in that moment of blasphemy, a hand appears out of nowhere and begins to write in fiery letters on the wall of that banquet hall. How many of you have ever heard the saying, the handwriting is on the wall? This is where it comes from. It comes directly from the Bible. Now, Belshazzar knew that something significant was going on, and he was kind of afraid. And so he called for his wise men to come and read the handwriting on the wall. And they all came in, and Belshazzar said, if you tell me what that says up there on the wall, I will give you great reward. And they all looked at the writing, and they said, we, we can't understand it. We don't know what it says. And then somebody remembered that many years ago, Belshazzar's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had a wise man named Daniel who was able to help him when nobody else could. It was many years later now, but Daniel was still alive and was still there in the kingdom.
king, I can... you first them. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Daniel says, I'll tell you what the words say, but you can keep your reward. Because by the end of the evening, you're not going to be in any position to reward anything to anybody. He was absolutely right. That night, Babylon fell. How did it fall? God actually told us the name of the person who brought about the destruction of Babylon, the fall of Babylon, 150 years before that person's birth. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number 1, we find God predicting the name of the person, the general Cyrus, who would bring about the fall of Babylon. In Isaiah 45, verse 1, it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Here's what happened. Remember how the walls surrounded the city of Babylon and the river flowed down through the middle of the city? Well, that river flowed underneath the exterior walls of the city. For some time prior to that evening, Cyrus had had his army working upriver of the city of Babylon to divert the flow of the river into a nearby valley. That very night that the banquet was held, they finished their excavations, and they, they turned the flow of the river Euphrates. When it flowed into the, river va into the valley nearby, the water level underneath the walls of the city of Babylon dropped. He then took his army, marched them down into the now dry riverbed underneath the exterior walls of the city of Babylon, up into the city, and the city fell with hardly even a fight. Historians have recorded it all very, very nicely so that we can go and see it, that it happened exactly that way today. God predicted how it would happen, and it happened just exactly. He even told us the name of the person who would bring about its destruction powerful, powerful picture from the pages of Scripture, from the prophecies of the Bible that lets us know that indeed we can trust the pages of Scripture. So that's how the city of Babylon fell. Let's take a look now at the next kingdom. The next kingdom was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. We take a look now at verse number 39. Verse 40. 39, pardon me. And after thee shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall rule over all the world, or the whole earth. This is verse number 39. A third kingdom, one of bronze or brass. What was the name of the next kingdom that came along? After the Medes and the Persians, which kingdom, many of you have studied uh, European history, which uh, kingdom came along and took over the Medes and the Persians? Greece, a lot of you know that. So we have here this belly and thighs of brass or bronze. Of course, that was the kingdom of Greece, Alexander the Great and his armies. They had uh, brass or bronze sh uh, shields and swords and armor. Uh, so again, very fitly described here. So this next kingdom comes along, the Greeks, and it takes over everything from the Medes and the Persians. Then after that, we have another kingdom that comes along. This is a kingdom of iron. We find it in verse number 40. Verse 40 says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Rome ruled from 168 B.C. down to the mid-4th century A.D. Now again, if you've studied European history, you know that Rome was not conquered by another world-ruling empire. It kind of disintegrated. It fell apart because of political and moral corruption. From the inside out, it sort of disintegrated. So in order for the Bible to be correct, it would have to show us Rome disintegrating. Now, was Rome a powerful empire, yes or no? Yes, it was. It was extremely powerful. In the days of Rome's power, there was a very significant literal historical figure who walked the earth. What was the name of that very important person who lived during the days of the Roman Empire? That was Jesus Christ. You may remember that Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. Roman spear pierced his side. Roman soldiers marched him down the Via Dolorosa. Roman spikes pierced his hands and his feet. So Jesus died during the days of the Roman Empire. But when he died, 
Who was responsible for Jesus' death? You know, some people blame, like to blame the Jews. It's not right. Some blame the Romans. It's not right either, is it? Who's responsible for Jesus' death? I am and you are. Why did Jesus die? For our what? For our sins. So it's no fair place in blame on other people. Our sins are what gave Jesus the need to die on that cross. Amen? How many of you are glad he chose to do so? That's the only reason we've got any hope in this life. You know, for God so loved the world. You know the verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's encouraging, isn't it? You know, when we see what's going on in the world today and we keep thinking it can't get any worse than this, does it get worse? It does. But I'll tell you what, there is hope in Jesus Christ. Amen? We focus on him. He can see us through any trial, any tribulation, any difficulty that, that the world can throw at us. Amen? So Rome ruled from 168 B.C. down to the mid-4th century A.D. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the end time of that, uh, that segment there on an upcoming evening. Rome, as I mentioned, kind of disintegrated from the inside out. Let's take a look at verse 41. Verse 41 says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be what? Divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Rome did indeed divide. And there are ten basic divisions of the Roman Empire. And I'll put those ten basic divisions up here on the screen. They're, uh, they're old names and then kind of their modern counterparts. We had the Alemanni, they eventually became the Germans. The Burgundians, they are today the Swiss. The Franks, they would be the French. The Lombards, today we know them, we know them as the Italians. The Saxons are the English. We also then have the Suivi, they are the Portuguese. The Visigoths today, of course, those would be the Spanish. There are three other people groups who are today extinct. They are the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Those three people groups play a significant role in Bible prophecy. And in a couple of nights, we're going to come back and take a look at them and see why they are so significant. Now, some of you are sitting here kind of scratching your head right now and thinking, you know, this is kind of an interesting history lesson, Eric, but what does this have to do with me living today? What, how does this kind of all fit in with Bible prophecy? I understand the geography and kind of how all these com countries are come together in Europe today. Here's why it's significant. There are many Bible prophecy scholars who have come to the conclusion that the Antichrist is going to rise from somewhere in Europe. How many of you have heard that before? Somewhere in Europe. One of the reasons why they've come to this conclusion is because of the prophecy that we are looking at tonight. On the very first night, we are taking a look at how, at how prophecy events are coming together, how they're all sort of forming. And if we can understand this, it will help us to understand the identity of the Antichrist, which we're going to be looking at in the very near future. In fact, on Monday night, we're going to be looking at the great imposter, the Antichrist. So you don't want to miss Monday evening. Very significant topics that we're going to be covering very, very soon. So a lot of people believe that the Antichrist is going to come from Europe, and we're going to pull some pieces together as we go. Now let's take a look again at verse number 41. It says that they're going to be divided. Now if we come down to verse number 42, it says, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. When you think about Europe today, are there some nations that are stronger and some nations that are weaker, yes or no? Yes, there are. This is kind of interesting. God is walking us down through time. He is predicting, prior to the events occurring, what's going to happen. And he walks us right down through these, these huge events. Empires rise and empires fall. And he tells us with amazing accuracy how it'll happen. Then he gets down to Rome, and he says Rome isn't going to be conquered by another world ruling empire. It's going to kind of disintegrate. Is, it, is that what happened? It did indeed. And then he says here in, in the last verse that we looked at, verse number 42, some of those divisions will be strong and some of them will be broken. He's walking us right down through history in the pages of Scripture in advance. Do you think maybe there's something about the Bible we can begin to trust? If he can tell us all this in advance, that's exactly what he's trying to tell us. God is trying to tell us tonight that he wants to communicate with us. 
He's trying to tell us that he wants to give us a message. The message is, maybe it's time to spend more time in his word. Maybe it's time to study it a little more deeply, a little bit longer. Maybe a, a cursory surface study isn't what it's all about. Maybe there's meat to be brought out of this great volume. Amen? Amen. That's why a lot of people today, thinking people, intelligent people, are turning back to the Bible. They're think, you know the Bible is the only holy book in existence that has accurately foretold the rise and fall of world empires? It's the only one. That's why a lot of people are looking back at it and saying there's something here. Well, let's keep looking at these, uh, these prophecies. Verse number 43 says, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So we have the feet and toes here uh, kind of all mingled with the, the iron and the clay. So they would try to unite, but wouldn't succeed. What about Europe today? Have there been attempts in the past several hundred years to reunite Europe? Yes or no? Yes. Have they failed or succeeded? They've failed. Can you think of one significant Frenchman who attempted to reunite Europe? There's kind of a little hit up on the screen there. What's his name? Napoleon, right? Did Napoleon look like he was maybe going to succeed, right? But uh, did he? No, he didn't. In fact, it, it looked like he was going to, but then he, uh, you know, while he was kind of at the height of his success, if we can call it that, a devout man came to him and told him, you know, according to the prophecies of the Bible, you will never succeed in reuniting Europe. You know what Napoleon supposedly told him? Not even God can stop me. Ooh, those are big words for a little man, aren't they? In fact, those are big words for a man of any size. Did God stop him? He did. Napoleon was marching his army north, ran into some snow, had to turn back around to a place called Waterloo, and it began to rain. His artillery became bogged down in the mud. One of his generals attacked too early, tipping off the enemy, and he lost it all at Waterloo. Historians tell us that he beat his fist in the mud and cried out, God Almighty is too much for me. Yeah. Amen to that, right? Yeah. You know, just a few simple words of Scripture have brought to an end the desires for conquest of many in Europe. You know what those words are? They shall not cleave one to another. God said re Europe would not be reunited. But, but, but what about the euro? Isn't that reuniting Europe? Some people think so. But you know what I prefer to trust? I prefer to trust the Bible. God says they shall not cleave one to another. It may look like they're going to get together, but it's not going to happen, God says. They're not going to stick together. Will there be more attempts? Have there been any other attempts? How about Hitler? How about Mussolini? How about Stalin? Did they all try? Yes. Did they succeed? No. How about communism? You know, for many years, there was a fear that communism was going to overrun the entire world. How many of you remember the Cold War? Remember? I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. Some of you are going, what? Some of you younger ones? No, there was, there was a very real fear that that Iron Curtain was just going to keep advancing. But all of a sudden, it stopped. All of a sudden, the Berlin Wall fell. How many of you remember that? You know, I, I lived over in Germany when it was still divided. I got to go into East Berlin to see what it was all about. I've seen things on both sides of the wall. But you know what? It's really powerful when you see Bible prophecy come to pass. All of a sudden, that just communism just kind of crumbled from what it used to be. And you begin to see these great headlines in the newspapers and in the magazines. One is uh, the end of the USSR. Soviet Union no longer exists. Russia reborn. And the world changed. The Iron Curtain opened up. And Christian ministries like Amazing Facts were able to go over into those formerly closed countries and begin to share about Jesus Christ with other people. And thousands upon thousands of people's lives were changed. Some of our speakers went over there. In fact, I was over there just a few months ago in Ukraine, 
sharing these messages with some people over there. Many of them weren't really familiar with Christianity. It's begun to, to flourish in different parts, but here you can see a picture of several, uh, in fact, a number of people, a number of people who are being, uh, giving their lives to Jesus Christ, being baptized at the end of the seminars that we held over there. I think we had over 100 people who gave their lives to Jesus Christ at the end of those seminars. Had a team of people over there, powerful messages were shared, and many people, they looked at the pages of Scripture, they looked at the prophecies, and they said, you know what? This is accurate. And if it's historically accurate, if all these, these nations, these kingdoms rose and fell just as God predicted so many years in advance, well, then maybe other parts of the Bible are accurate. Maybe Jesus is for real. And they started studying it. And the Lord worked on their hearts, and they began to see that there was something bigger going on in the world than they understood. The Bible says they shall not cleave one to another. Time and again, there have been efforts to bring things back together, but it just hasn't happened because God said it will not happen. How many of you believe God? We can trust what God's Word says. Now let's take a look at another very significant aspect of this prophecy. In verse number 45, it says, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain in the interpretation thereof uh, sure. So he talks about this great stone that comes and hits the feet of this, this huge monument, this huge statue. And when this stone hits the feet of the statue, what happens to the statue? It's destroyed. This stone, this rock, what does that rock represent? That is Jesus Christ in his kingdom. How many of you have heard the song, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? Heard that? That stone, that rock is Jesus Christ. That is his eternal kingdom that he has promised to come and set up. In this kingdom, there will be no more pain, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more death, there will be no more sadness, there will be no more illness, no more migraines, no more arthritis, no more acne. If I hit just about everybody here, right? <laughs> All of these things are going to ultimately disappear. Wouldn't it be nice if that kingdom was here right now? You know, it may not be here quite yet, but it's coming soon. The prophecies of the Bible tell us that Jesus is coming again very, very soon. Jesus as that rock that's predicted here is going to strike the feet of this image and bring to an end all the things that we associate with power today. But when he rules, what a just and loving ruler he will be. Amen? So if we want to consider that this story, this picture, this vision that we have in the Bible tonight is a timeline of Earth's history. Where then would we be in that timeline of Earth's history? Would we be in the head of gold when Nebuchadnezzar is ruling, yes or no? No, of course not. What about the chests and arms of silver when the Medes and the Persians are ruling? Would we be living around that time? No. How about the belly and thighs of brass when Alexander the Great is ruling? How about the legs of iron when the Caesars are ruling the world? No. Are we living now during the time of the feet in, of iron and clay when Europe is divided and there are some strong nations and some weak nations and there are attempts to reunite Europe but every one of those attempts continues to fail? Does that sound like a time in which perhaps we live, yes or no? Yes. In fact, I would submit to you that we are not only in the feet of and toes of iron and clay, we are hanging off the tips of the toenails, about to plummet into eternity. And you know what? That is a great place for a Christian to be, because that means that the next big event on this prophetic timeline is the coming of the rock, and that's who? And that is Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to kind of flesh this basic outline out a little bit more as we continue through this seminar. But there's a powerful parallel uh, chapter in the book of Matthew that goes right alongside with what we're studying here this evening in the book of Daniel. A powerful chapter that talks about end-time events just before Jesus comes. And that's in Matthew chapter 24. 
In Matthew chapter 24, in verse number 7, Jesus says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Wars and rumors of wars, he also talks about famines, pestilences. Are we seeing lots of wars? Are we seeing lots of famines? Are we seeing lots of diseases or pestilences? Yes. Uh, he also talks about earthquakes in diverse places. Are we seeing some pretty significant earthquakes? You know, what about volcanic activity? Seeing some of that too, right? Now, when you look at Matthew 24, some people will look at this verse and they'll say, you know what, there have always been wars. Have there always been wars, yes or no? Yes. They say, you know, there have always been earthquakes. Have there? Yes. There have always been diseases and famines. These things have gone on for thousands and thousands of years. How many of you have heard that before? Right? Yes, that's true. But when you read Matthew 24 in context, read it all the way through, you'll see that Jesus is not just talking about wars and earthquakes and diseases and famines. He's talking about a marked increase in the, in the frequency and the severity of these events. The graph that you see up on the screen is from the U.S. Geological Survey. They keep track of earthquakes, the magnitude of the earthquakes, the frequency of the earthquakes, when they occurred. This is a graph of the major earthquakes. This is between 6 and 8 on the Richter scale. These are, these are the big boys, okay? For the last 100 years, left side, 1900, right side, 2008. Kind of looks normal, doesn't it? Or do you see something different toward the end there? That's between 2000 and 2008. They didn't have 2010 on there yet. I think it's probably going to bump up even further. What do you think? Yeah. You know, this is not business as usual. This is not what's been going on for a long, long time. This is Jesus saying, I'm coming back. He's saying, I'm coming back soon. And I want to have a lot of people ready. In fact, most especially, he's saying, I want to have you ready. Amen? Amen. You know, take a look at that. Back to, to Daniel chapter uh, 2 again, verse number 44. In Daniel 2, verse number 44, it says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand how long? It says, it shall stand forever. God's promise is that his kingdom that he's going to set up will have no end. It will be a kingdom of peace, of happiness, of joy, and he wants me to be a part of it, and he wants you to be a part of it. Turn over to Revelation chapter 11 here. Revelation chapter 11 And we'll take a look at verse number 15. In Revelation 11, verse 15, it says that the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become, become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign, how long? Forever and ever. It's a beautiful promise, isn't it? You know, consider once again this timeline of events. Let's look at this statue and walk our way down through them. We have the head of gold representing Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, that's Medes and the Persians, the belly and thighs of brass or bronze is Greece, the legs of iron Rome, and the feet of iron and clay divided Europe. In fact, if you'd like some cross-references to these different nations, Babylon, of course, you can read that uh, through the book of Daniel here. We've just been reading about it. The Medes and the Persians, you can read about that in Daniel chapter 8, verse number 20. God names that empire. In the very next verse, Daniel 8, verse 21, he identifies the kingdom of Greece as the next world-ruling empire that would come along. He just walks us right down and tells us the names of these empires. And then you read through the, uh, through the Gospels and you read all about Rome. One right after the other, and down we come to, divide, to the divided Europe, the feet of iron and clay. Now, if Babylon came and went just as God predicted, and if Medo-Persia came and went just as God predicted. And Greece came and went just as God predicted. And Rome came and went, and we're living in divided Europe today. I'm not a betting man. But if I was, how many of you would think that maybe 
if all these things have come to pass just like God said, maybe, just maybe, that rock is going to come too. You think so? If we could just about bank on that. But much of the world today isn't sure. In fact, different magazines have asked whether the Bible is true or not. In fact, here's a very uh, sign- a, a, a recent new, uh, magazine article that asked basically, is the Bible true? U.S. News and World Report. There are a lot of people who want us to question the authority of the Bible. I found a poem not too long ago called The Anvil that I think answers this question very nicely. It says, last eve I paused beside a blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. And looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have, I ha- have you had, said I, to wear and batter out those hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptics' blows have beat upon. But though the sound of falling blows is heard, the anvil still remains, the hammers gone. There have been many, many blows struck against the volume that you hold in your hands, but this has withstood the test of time. This volume has changed people's lives because it reveals a Savior who loves them. Amen? You know, in a world of uncertainty, the Bible provides us with certainty. It is something that we can trust. Amen? You know, the Bible also talks about the mark of the beast. Could it be that we are living in the predicted time of the mark of the beast? Could it be coming very, very shortly? You know, the Bible talks about it coming very shortly. In fact, in Revelation chapter 13, it says this, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Coming soon. But I want to leave you with this thought. Jesus is in control. And he wants you to know him personally and have a relationship with him. Amen? Is that your desire to get to know Jesus a little bit better and maybe study his word as well? It's mine as well. Let's have a word of prayer before we end this evening. Father, we ask that you'll be with us. Touch our hearts as we study your word. Help us to find truth where we know it can be found. We ask that you'll bless us in our studies and help us to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.